forensic detectives, really in all of North America, who has always been a defender of the official account of the Kennedy assassination. He supports the Warren Commission findings, essentially. Of course, they made a number of errors early on. He does not find them errors of great consequence. Subject to later revision, he's, he's aware of the revisions, but he essentially holds with the original lone gunman Oswald view. Uh, he will be, in effect, countered. I'm not sure to the extent, because I don't know the full dimension of the man's view, is by Professor David Kaiser, joining us by telephone, one of the skeptics about the Oswald scenario. Uh, Kaiser is professor of history at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and he believes that the Oswald story is not the right story, apparently. I don't quite know the extent of that. We'll find out as it gets on the program. We'll talk about the JFK assassination 25 years after in the uh, noon hour. Then at 1 o'clock, uh, open line, you look at the bullet and what the bullet is supposed to have gone through, the first bullet, not the one that ultimately killed Kennedy, but the supposedly first bullet, first bullet to strike people. There was apparently another bullet that was fired initially that struck nothing. It's hard to believe it went through Kennedy... And then Connolly smashing bone and going through two separate bodies and emerging essentially unscathed. Yeah. He's been very eloquent on that, Dr. Wack. Yes, well, I'm, I'm sure he is. Sir Wack was very eloquent uh, upon uh, myself when I was in Pittsburgh, and if he had had his brothers, he would have shot me. A uh, single yes. bullet or a double or two. Tough man. Listen, Some uh, of have been answered, like the number of shots that were fired, the acoustic evidence turned out to be a cold trail, as I guess you know. Mm-hmm. You know, that was, that turned out to be nothing. Uh, some very interesting research was done on that. But there are very interesting questions that emerge, and the best of the documentaries that's been done is Nova's documentary, narrated by Walter Cronkite. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, yes, I have. It was really good. Didn't answer the questions, presented a lot of questions, presented the official answers to them, some of which were marginally persuasive, others of which were not. Mm-hmm. But I must say that I've been re-intrigued well, by the right. Kennedy mysteries, and I'm not even sure that today will be the end of it, by the way. No. It's, um, no to, in terms of this, whole, this program, I mean. Right. It's conceivable to me that if if I have my brothers, if I have my will, I might, might do something next week on it, too. Good. All right. Look forward to listening. Thanks for calling. Okay. Bye. Who killed the president and why this was allowed to happen than there were then? Join us this Saturday night at 8 for a two-hour look into the Kennedy assassination 25... Uh, you know, we One of the nation's most celebrated experts on violent death, analyze and confront what is perhaps the nation's most enduringly controversial and still mysterious violent death, the assassination of President John Kennedy, the, 21st, the 25th anniversary of which, I'll get it right, comes up next week. Our guests are Dr. Warner Spitz, the recently retired chief medical examiner of Wayne County, who remains professionally active as a consultant and who has had an intimate role in the investigation of the Kennedy assassination. And by telephone, uh, Professor David Kaiser of the History Department at Carnegie Mellon University, quoted in a news account in the New York Times today as one of the skeptics about the official account of the assassination. Dr. Spitz, welcome back to you. Glad to have you back, sir. Thank you. And Professor Kaiser, welcome to you. Glad to have you on the program, sir. It's nice to be on the program. Thank you. Now, Dr. Spitz, by way of identification, by way of credentials, why don't you lay out for us at the beginning here your own role in past investigations of the JFK killing? I, I was a member of the uh, Nelson Rockefeller Committee on uh, uh, Assassinations, and uh, that was in 1975. And there I was, the forensic pathologist of a group of five people, including a radiologist, a neuropathologist, a uh, ballistic expert, and an attorney. And then in 1978, I was a member of the House Assassination Committee, uh, House of Representatives, and um, that was a committee of, I believe, eight or nine pathologists only, uh, usually... Um, forensic pathologist from various parts of the country. Is it fair to say that you, in both events, in both investigations, came out officially, uh, came out endorsing more or less the official account, Oswald the lone gunman, not a conspiracy, not other gunmen, not other uh, unproven assistance for Oswald? Well, it has always been my position that uh, the uh, shots were fired from the back of the president that uh, they came from the same direction uh, that is the two shots 
that uh, hit the president, there's absolutely no reason to believe, in my opinion, that uh, there were any shots fired, fired from any other direction. In other words, I uh, do not subscribe to the theory of a conspiracy. I don't. I do not know. I do not profess to know how many uh, people fired, but there's no reason to believe that there was more than one. Okay. And as for you, uh, Professor Kaiser, what is your overall view of this? However you want to put it. Well, um, I don't think that I have a specific disagreement with Dr. Smith. Is it? Smith. 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 S P I T. I think your part. Uh, on the questions that uh, he specifically referred to and that he has studied in detail. Um, I have studied a lot of the work that's been done in the case, and I wrote a fairly long piece on it five years ago, and I don't believe anything new has come up. Uh, I have no reason whatever to dispute the medical evidence he referred to or that uh, the shots came from behind or, for that matter, even that the shots uh, that hit President Kennedy and Governor Connolly were fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, let's make clear at this point, and forgive the interruption, that sure. some do dispute it, including a professional colleague in the larger community of medical examiners, Cyril Weck, from your own city, seems to dispute the uh, single bullet theory in terms of what it did to Kennedy and then and then Connolly, but we'll get to that as we go along. He, he does. He, he hasn't convinced me, and I have interviewed Dr. Weck, but we can get into that later. Sure. Now, I would say, though, two things. Um... First of all, there is evidence, although it isn't conclusive, of another gunman. There was eyewitness evidence at the time. Uh, many of the people in the plaza thought that someone fired from the grassy knoll. And there was acoustics evidence developed with by the assassination committee. However, that was that was rebutted. Then. It has been called into question, and it, it leaves us with a fascinating puzzle. And in fact, it's somewhat frustrating because uh, if somebody was willing to put up, my understanding is there's a couple hundred thousand dollars, although I'm not sure now, we could shed some more light on that puzzle, although it's an extremely complicated business. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know. Go on, I'm sorry. The, the, the thing that still puzzles me, fascinates me, troubles me, is that um, there are a great many questions perhaps unanswerable questions about associations of Oswald, about Jack Ruby, about his associations, and about possible connections of other parties uh, that have not been resolved. Now, let's, let's talk about those as we go along here. Our number is 559-1270. Talking about the Kennedy assassination on its 25th anniversary, again, our guest, Historian David Kaiser and medical examiner Dr. Werner Spitz, a man of international reputation who, as you heard, has involved himself as a professional witness in two separate investigations of the Kennedy assassination. And we'll have more in just a moment, and we invite your calls again at 559-1270 on WXYT. Well, this is Dr. Werner Spitz, the internationally prominent medical examiner who's investigated professionally uh, twice, at least uh, twice, and has thought about it, I guess, for the ensuing 25 years, and has been often quoted about it. Question for you, Dr. Spitz, uh, your colleague, uh, Dr. Weck, whom you respect, because I, I remember doing, we've talked about him before, you and I, has made very, very strong emphasis on how implausible the single bullet theory is. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. The bullet that initially struck Kennedy, back of the neck, emerges from his chest, makes a zigzag turn, strikes Connolly, what, on his right side smashes bone, destroys the fifth rib, emerges and strikes his wrist bone, smashes part of that, winds up in his, what, right thigh? Is that how it went? I believe, yes, one of the thighs that under color. The bullet is pristine and wet in the recent Nova documentary points out that all subsequent tests seems to show that bullets cannot accomplish all of those impacts and turns and remain in that condition. That's the first aspect of the so-called magic bullet theory. Also, the finding of it, the provenance of it is weird. Finding it on the stretcher, according to an orderly, a hospital orderly, the wrong stretcher, not Donnelly's stretcher, also seems to suggest hanky-panky. But talk about how a bullet can make all that, all the, those multiple impacts emerge through two bodies and still remain in more or less brand-new condition. 
I disagree. You disagree with what? I disagree with the theory that one bullet cannot do this. Okay. Let me explain. Please. The bullet went into... First of all, it's a high-power rifle bullet mm -hmm. of military... Uh, Mamlaker Carcano 6.5 millimeter right. military round. Right. And uh, these are, of course, uh, jacketed bullets, very hard uh, material. This jacket it served as a jacket for this uh, bullet. Now, this bullet hit Kennedy in uh, uh, the back of the right shoulder, and it went uh, through soft tissues in an upwardly direction and came out of the neck. In and other words, it makes an upward turn once inside his body? It, yes, but if you, it makes an upward turn inside his body, but if, uh, that's if the body is very stretched out. If the, if the head is down, if the head is turned a little bit, and if the uh, shoulders are relaxed, then it is completely understandable how, in spite of having an upward track, the wound could have come from an upward uh, okay. source. So <clears throat> the bullet at that point strikes no bones at all and comes out of the neck in a perfectly understandable course. There are two little fragments of bone broken, of two vertebrae broken in the neck. And I am of the belief that instead of... Uh, uh, Striking those bones, the bullet went very close to them and broke them because they're not very uh, strong bones. And there are little fragments of lead which spewed out of the base of the bullet, which is not jacketed, um, in its passage along the neck. It comes out of the neck immediately to the left of the midline in the area of the uh, Necktie next to the knot of the necktie. Then it enters Connolly's back and breaks the fifth rib. Comes out again, and after, mind you, hitting nothing other than soft tissues again except for the rib. Well, the, the, the wet dwells on the rib, though. Wet, wet seems to regard the rib as significant impact and potentially damaging impact to the bullet. So he says, the, uh, and, and said it very forcefully on the yes. documentary. A rib is not a very uh, thick piece of bone. It is at the most, I would say, a quarter of an inch in thickness. It's uh, uh, got a very uh, thick, spongy part in the middle. The outside of the rib is very thin and certainly not thicker than uh, maybe a sixteenth of an inch. And uh, I cannot conceive of a rib causing that much damage to a bullet. All right, so what? Is, 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 uh, go, go ahead, uh, Dr. Kaiser. Uh, jump in whenever well, you want actually, to. my question is about the other bullet, so maybe you want to finish this up first. Sure, let's finish this up okay, then. Uh, wet, wet, I mean, it's going the whole complete opposite direction on yes. the impact with the fifth rib. I, that's why I'm saying I do not I mean, agree at all. I mean, how can you disagree? All. Forgive me, but outside your professional community, you've got two prominent medical examiners who have a totally different view of the impact of this bullet on a rib. I mean, what's, what's so hard well, to figure out? it should not be forgotten that the bullet is not pristine. The bullet... Looks pristine. No, the bullet, I thought it was. I held it, I held it in, my, in my hand. The bullet is flattened, somewhat flattened, in spite of this very uh, strong, very re resistant uh, jacket that it has, it is flattened as if hit with a hammer on uh, the lower portion of the bullet close to the base, which is the area at which there has been some um, rubbing of the bullet against a very, against a firm object. No, a firm object could be a bone. Well, let me jump in for a second because uh, in, in real life, of course, you always have to compare something to something. And what Wecht is persuasive on is in comparing the so-called pristine bullet, whether it really is, to other test bullets. The uh, test bullets fired into goat, goat carcasses, into gelatin, and those that weren't fired at all. Now, those that have, for example, been used on a human cadaver, which Weck shows in the, in the Nova documentary, are substantially deformed, with much less impact. Yes, I'm... Soft tissue impact. I'm not uh, aware of uh, those experiments that Dr. Weck did, but I can tell you that uh, bullets... And uh, as a matter of routine, hard nose bullets, that is, bullets with jackets, do not get deformed 
by going through soft tissue. Uh, mind you, we see uh, lots and lots, oh, I should say we saw, I saw lots and lots of uh, shooting victims in my 35 years in this profession, both in Detroit and in other jurisdictions. We'll have to, we'll have to, they do not get deformed. Okay, we have to we kind of leave this point because we can get stuck on it forever, I guess, and regard it as a professional disagreement. But I want to make the larger point before we break and then move to other bullets that Dr. Kaiser is prepared to talk about. And that is, if you accept the direction in which Dr. Wecht is going, you can't accept Oswald as the lone gunman because it is physically impossible for another bullet, if you accept the direction in which Wecht is going, another bullet to have been fired by Oswald. It means, at the very least, another gunman and a conspiracy to conceal the existence of that other gunman. We're talking about a single action, bolt action rifle, which requires not only the uh, chambering of a round by separate action after each round, but also the acquisition of the target picture in a scope. It can't be done in the amount of time that the Zapruder film indicates, which is, I guess, the best piece of physical evidence we have. I disagree so with that too. You do, huh? Yes, because the Bruder film does not... Ch you see, the first shot when Kennedy is hit is when he is passing behind a road sign which right. indicates the upcoming freeway. Right. And you do really, you really don't know when, at exactly the point when Kennedy was hit in the shoulder. You think you know because of the echo. But we know very well that the echo follows the sound and not... Well, Josiah Thompson, who, who's, a, who's a, a fan of the conspiracy theories and has given evidence about it, uh, suggests that the important evidence is visual. You can see Kennedy reaching for his throat. When you can see distortion of his features. That is true. Before the sign uh, appears, or just before that. No, time. that's not true. You see him with his distorted face when he comes out from the sign. When he goes into behind the sign... Pardon me, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's right. Yeah. When he go, goes into behind the sign, he is smiling and he's waving to people on the right My side. point still stands, it seems to me. You can't get off another shot if Wecht is right, if it wasn't that separate is, bullets. If Wecht is right, that's true. But I think it's only fair to point out... Uh, I mean, Dr. Wecht is a fascinating figure, and he has never has been hesitant to speak his mind. But uh, Dr... Dr. Stitt, how many people were on the panel with the Assassinations Committee with you and him? I I think there were either eight, total was either eight or nine. Right, and it was either seven or eight to one, was it not? Uh, I think also uh, was the majority rules. I mean, you... Well, the, not the majority, but if you have seven or eight, nine qualified people, and eight of them think one thing, and the ninth thinks the other, then... Well, but it isn't it isn't a vote, after all. If, no, if one isn't. man can argue persuasively, as what clearly does... Yeah. But I, you see, David, I, I'm coming from quite a different point than you are here. Uh, okay. It is true that when the Warren Commission report was first issued, the single bullet theory looked improbable. And in a sense, I still think it looks improbable in that uh, it, it did require a lot of strange things for it to be true. And yet I am persuaded that the Assassinations Committee uh, put that one to rest and that, in fact, that probably is what did happen. Well, let's stipulate that it is true, because we got other fish to fry, okay, as I'm fine. fond of saying, and we'll, we'll come back to more of the Kennedy assassination story in just a moment with our two expert guests after these messages. Yeah. Surrounding the JFK assassination 25 years later, I say some of the questions, because the questions certainly must number in the thousands, and in a commercially crowded one-hour program, you can only consider a small fraction of them, but we're trying. I hope you understand. Our two expert guests, Dr. Werner Spitz, the internationally renowned medical examiner, recently retired as chief medical examiner of Wayne County, still professionally active as a consultant and working with other jurisdictions, and by telephone, Professor David Kaiser of the History Department at Carnegie Mellon University, who is a nationally quoted and nationally regarded uh, investigator in the academic sense into the Kennedy assassination. Our number is 559-1270. Lynn's been waiting for a while to ask a separate question, and Dr. Kaiser will get to the other bullet in just a moment. Okay. Here's Lynn from Livonia. Lynn? Uh, good afternoon. Hi. I'm calling in regards to uh, something I heard several years ago that uh, a great number of the eyewitnesses to the assassination, key people, had died uh, one form of death or another, be it violent or natural, uh, in, a, in a certain amount of time after the assassination. Is that true, and does that have any bearing on the conspiracy theory? Who would like to answer, Dr. Kaiser? How about you? That's I can give that one a try. Uh, 
it is not as clear cut as the people who have put that forward. Not nearly. You to believe. Uh, it depends on your definition of a person who was in some way involved in the assassination. Uh, again, the assassinations committee, which I think did the most thorough and and most responsible investigation concluded that that was a red herring. On the other hand, uh, specifically in dealing with a smaller number of people, there is a book by David Scheim called Contract on America, which uh, is the most cogent argument on, on behalf of the idea that it was organized crime who killed the president. Um, and he mentions a number of people surrounding Jack Ruby who died not too long after and now, I can unreservedly endorse that book because there were things in it that, that I had problems with because I was aware of, of what he was talking about. Because Jack Ruby's that. world, this is, this is unscientific, but Jack Ruby's world is a world, after all, in which sudden death and violent death well, and, and premature death are more common than in the general population. The world of a kind of small-time nightclub operator with admitted or, or recognized ties to the underworld is a world in which people tend to die soon. That's true, too. Too soon. That's true, too. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about um, the movie Executive Action? It really wasn't, uh, when I saw it several years ago, I don't think it was very popular in the country. Did certain people in the country try to suppress that movie because it gave people at least something to think about? I can tell you that I wasn't one of the suppressors. I interviewed David Miller, the director of it, and so that was on a program I was doing in Boston at the time. I thought it was rubbish, personally. Well, I wasn't impressed with the movie. It was a reputable theater, so it wasn't suppressed. Yeah, no, it showed it didn't get much of an audience. Okay, well, Thanks for the call. Thank you, bye bye. Now, on to your remarks about another bullet. Go ahead, Doctor. I just want to ask Dr. Spitz, since uh, this is one of the first opportunities I've had to ask somebody who really knows what they're talking about, about the second bullet that struck the president in the head. And assuming that it was the same type of bullet as the one we were talking about earlier. Uh, is it not at all surprising for, for that kind of bullet to have created this massive wound? And, and as I understand it, uh, and you've seen the pictures, I guess, literally blown away a good deal of the president's head. Well, the right upper quadrant of the head was more or less uh, um, demolished. Yes. It is not unusual for a high-power rifle uh, bullet um, to do this. Um, a mistake was made in so far that the back of the head was never shaved. Uh, there is every reason to believe that the entrance wound uh, was up towards the top of the head, namely in the area of the cowlick. Uh, the hair in that area, due to the uh, pe peculiar way in which the hair uh, turns, uh, like in a whirlpool, right. is a little bit more, the skin is a little bit more visible in that area than in other parts where the hair is combed over. Right. Uh, that bullet hole looks uh, if it is a bullet hole, looks very, very suggestive of a regular, usual uh, bullet wound of entrance like we see thousands of. I see. Uh, it is uh, known, and we have seen this many, many times, that uh, high-power rifles, wherever the, whereas they cause a lot of damage at the exit, cause a bullet wound of entrance which does not look any different from any other bullet wound of entrance even from a small caliber handgun okay there is all right so the the notion that this might in fact have been an exit wound of the bullet fired from the front of bassie knoll has no credence as far as you know i have there's no credence at all if you had seen the pictures and we saw uh, yeah. When we went to the archives in Washington, we saw the color pictures uh, that were taken at the time uh, projected on a big wall. There is really very little doubt that the one injury in the area of the cowlick is an entrance wound. What Stand happened up. to that bullet, do you think? What happened to the bullet, uh, Doctor? I don't know. You see the... Uh, well, i got uh, a question about the other bullet. I don't want to get stuck on the first team bullet, but we've never s satisfied, and we won't. This is really a separate question. After weather, though, Dr. Spitz, I do want to ask you, 
about how the pristine bullet, quote-unquote, was found on the wrong stretcher. What the heck was that about? An orderly swears up and down that it was on not the Connolly stretcher, but a separate stretcher that had nothing to do with Connolly. I, I understand. It to be believed. What is that? I am i don't know how it got there, but I can say this. I'll it tell you how it could have gotten there. I mean, to, somebody to picked the... it up and put it there. Exactly. 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 Why? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe somebody saw it, didn't want to keep it, and put it back in the wrong place. I don't. I true. really could only speculate. Here's on the that. bullet that passed through. Oh, I better put it back. Oh, where's the stretcher? Here's the stretcher. In other words, an yes. innocent provenance for that seemingly mysterious. Possibly, thing. but I don't know that I'm in a position of speculating on it. What I can tell you is that, in my opinion, there is really no doubt at all that the bullet, such as the one in question here, could go through Kennedy's shoulder and neck to his wrist which has relatively thin bones as compared to the rest of the arm or the hand. Well, that's... And then through the thigh and grave the femur, which is the bone of the thigh, without, with just being uh, squeezed, if you will, or crushed a little bit at the base without any more damage on the thigh. Doctor, you reminded me of something, which is the one question I still have. As I've said, I don't disagree with you about this, but there's something Josiah Thompson always mentions which does give me pause. Let me see if I can put it correctly. At the moment, looking at the Zapruder film, at the moment where Connolly must have already been hit, if we're accepting the single board theory, I believe you see him still holding his hat in that right hand, where the wrist has supposedly already been hit. Right. Does, does that seem possible to you? I don't know. There's a lack of contemporary or simultaneous effect. It's one of the strongest points that Josiah Thompson well, makes. Emerging well, from behind the sign, and you, you focused it down more narrowly and, and, and more concretely, Dr. Kaiser, is a very strong point for the Josiah Thompson scenario. Well, I don't know if it is or not. That's well, let's find I out. Have. Let's find, uh, seemingly, I should put it that way, yeah. Doctor. I seem to remember the hat resting on his lap. Oh, well, and perhaps so. There is no reason why his hand should be moved away from that area, whether it's holding or not, I'm, I don't really know that it is. And I don't know that it would, the shot would necessarily, cha necessarily change that. I think the hat is resting on the lap, and I ha have the recollection that I never took offense at that position. One thing I want to tell you is that we, uh, the fact that Connolly does not indicate with his face that he is in distress at the same time that uh, yes. Kennedy is. There's no big deal to you. There's no big deal to me because, because if you what? think back for a minute, uh, when uh, President Reagan was hit by a bullet, he didn't even know that he was hit. He well, went to the hospital even though and they Kennedy told him that he did. Even uh, though I, Kennedy... I say to my friends that if you want to test that, that theory, what you'll have to do is you'll have to shoot 50 people in situations where they're not expecting to be shot and see how long they take. Oh, them. maybe more than that. Maybe in well, order to make them scientific, and 900 or 1,000. That's the usual have, sampling. Have an opportunity to run that experiment. All right, we'll have more in a moment. 42 degrees, weekend weather now with Tom Churchill. I mean, JFK assassination is what we're talking about this hour from the perspective of a historian and a forensic detective and one of the most prominent in the nation, and Dr. Werner Spitz. Uh, by popular demand, we've, uh, we've prevailed upon both of our guests to stay longer than the hour since there's so many things to talk about here and not enough time in one hour to do it, and I'm grateful for the acquiescence of both men in that, uh, in that wish. Here's Chris from Flint now on WXYT. Chris? Yeah, hi, David. Hi, Chris. Uh, my, I'm going to take a completely different direction than what's one, of, one that's been done. Feel free. Uh, the lift and butt. Uh, the best governor, please. <laughs> please, says Dr. Kaiser. Please, he says. Meaning what, Dr. Kaiser? Well, I don't want to cut the guest off. Go ahead. Well, look, looking at, at some of the different evidence, number one, the head snap. Okay, going backwards. I'm, I'm no physics expert, but... It seems to suggest that the shot came from the front. Well, we've got Dr. Spitz to help answer that one, too, by the way. Okay, number two is the, uh, the FBI uh, agent statement of surgery of the head area. And number three is the switching of the casket. You have the funeral employee from Dallas saying you put the president in a bronze casket wrapped in sheet. Then the, uh, the uh, Navy um, um, officer, I don't think he was a Navy officer, but the, the Naval um, man talking about taking him out of a gray cast if he was in a body bag. Now, the, And the brain's never been found either. Now, there's so many different shenanigans that were played with the body. I mean, some, something has to be has to be wrong here. What well, there may be something that's wrong without there being 
a conspiracy or a separate scenario involved. That's the, that's a possibility that a lot of conspiracy theorists really don't acknowledge. Hanky panky that has no larger and darker purpose beyond hanky panky. Yeah, but it seemed like the Secret Service really wanted to keep a lot quiet. They went back and talked to the Parkland doctors and say, "Isn't this really what you saw in the in the emergency room here?" Well, let's take them in order. For one, the head snapping back, Doctor Swift. The head snapping back is something which you would expect in a situation like this, even though the uh, shot came from the back, because there is something that's totally unrelated to physics, where uh, the body goes instantaneously into a position of what is known as opistotonus, which which is a position of tremendous curving, curvature of the backbone of the spine and a forward uh, arching of the abdomen with a backward snap of the of the head. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, and then occurs the contrary. So I'm not surprised that uh, the head would snap this way. Switched caskets, missing brain. What? Yes. Evidence. Yeah. Who would that want to happens, steal the brain? Unfortunately, that happens in pathology departments not that infrequently. That brains are. Uh, or organs, I should say, are put aside in a bucket, and then later on somebody forgot to uh, uh, no, put no, it with the body. Not a matter of Doctor, was the brain removed during the autopsy of the Naval Hall? No, it was gone. It was, according to the book, it was gone. No, I'm asking Dr. Spitz. Dr. Spitz. Spitz. Yeah, the brain was examined. The brain was taken out. What? Oh, no, I think. And the brain was examined. The, uh, in fact, there are pictures showing the brain. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, problem is that uh, if today you try and find the brain, they, nobody knows where it's gone. Well, the Secret Service has an ongoing responsibility to safeguard evidence. Where, where were they? I don't know that the Secret Service... I, uh, it may be so, but I don't know that the Secret Service was in the autopsy room guarding the organs. Right, so I kind of doubt that. I kind of doubt that. If, if this autopsy was handled as uh, any other type of autopsy, I, I, I realize it's the president of the country and maybe it was handled somewhat differently, but the organ would be placed in a bucket to be fixed in formaldehyde and possibly then forgotten to be placed with the body. There was a lot of there was a lot of things that were forgotten that should have been done that were not done, so I'm not really that surprised if the brain stayed behind. What about the surgery of the hattery? Were the FBI just mistaken on that? I don't know that at any point there was surgery to the head. Well, but there is <clears throat> no evidence to me, it, in my book of any surgery to the head. And anyway, Ariel Breeden set this end apparently from either of our guests. Okay. Thanks for the call. More in a moment on WXYT. Extra, extra, read all about it. Microstation, your software specialist, is offering big savings this fall. Extra, extra, read all about it. Oh, here you go, fellow. I'll take one of those. Let's see, it says this microstation has special pricing on a huge inventory of accessories, supplies, and software, including discs, ribbons, disc cases, cables, mice, and paper products. Oh, and now nine different desktop publishing software programs are all reduced, like the Aldous Pacemaker, the software program that gives you everything you need to provide any document from simple forms and financing to sophisticated books and brochures. Oh, and hey, the Panasonic... As far as the ballistic evidence, all the bullets fired, don't they? And all the bullets that have been found... Uh, were shown to have been fired from Oswald's gun, is, uh, I, I thought. Secondly, uh, overall, didn't the Congressional Committee in 78 say that overall uh, there was a conspiracy to kill the president? And my two questions are, uh, how was the... I watched an overshow the other night. Uh, I need a, I'd like a little more information on how the acoustic evidence was refuted, that there were four bullets that has been refuted. And uh, I wonder what you both think of the book Best Evidence by Mr. Lifkin. Well, they, they were. I haven't read David Lifton's book or Robert Lifton's book. I get those two Liftons confused. Uh, both of them don't think much of it, as I understand it. Certainly, uh, Dr. Kaiser does That's not. True. As far as the acoustic evidence is concerned, it remained for what an Ohio musician to point out that uh, there was a lack of simultaneous uh, a pinpointing of of the sounds. That in fact, the sounds that were recorded occurred after the assassination. Well, that that it. There is something on the tape which certainly seems to point that way, but this is a a fantastic puzzle, and it could be straightened out, 
Apollo would, it would cost some money, and somebody ought to straighten it out, because on the one hand... Is that Dr. Kaiser talking? Or? Yes, okay. that's right. Because on the one hand, the very reputable acoustic scientists and computer scientists who worked on it found, uh, thought, that they had extremely good evidence in the form of, of what they call acoustic fingerprints, that this was a tape of four gunshots fired in Dewey Plaza, picked up by that motorcycle. Uh, and more evidence could be developed on that point. Well, but the time track... Well, wait a second, though. But, th but here's my point. That the, but now, and more evidence could be developed on that point, because they only did the most thorough analysis on the one the one sound which they were interpreting to be the grass and all shot. Now, on the other hand, the evidence of this voice on the tape does suggest that, that the noises that they were analyzing occurred after the shooting. Now, right. something is very wrong. Either their analysis was nowhere near as good as they thought it was, or, and, and you see, the Academy of Sciences couldn't really refute their analysis. It, 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 it refuted part of it, but it let a lot of it stand. And either, either their analysis is altogether wrong, or... There was some other explanation as to how that other voice got onto the tape at that point. Don't ask me what it is, because I don't know. But it, it is left in the state of an incredible puzzle, and I really wish that somebody would uh, do the addition. All right, so neither explanation right now is satisfactory. You have an irreconcilable set that of is my analysis. Yeah. All right, back yeah. to our caller. Mr. Mr. Listen, well, why did he just like that Devin? Uh, Dr. Kaiser, make this quick because we've got to break again. Yes, I can make it very quick. Uh, I'm a historian, and I know a lot of crazy things happen in the world, but not that crazy. And I think that this is the biggest problem in the whole thing. What's so crazy about what Lipton says? The idea that somebody was prepared at that particular moment on that afternoon to remove the body somewhere and work it over, just uh, that that's not the world I live in. And, uh -huh. and also... Also, that, uh, and this was also on the Nova show, the doctors who worked in the trauma room at Parkland saw the photos, which Dr. Smith also saw, in the National Archives, and they said, that's the way I remember his head. You know, uh, the Lipton theory is that uh, somebody fired into the body later and uh, yeah. uh, to, to make things look like uh, something they were not. Yeah. But, you, you know, that is... Uh, assuming that forensic pathologists are uh, complete idiots. Got to break in, guys. We're okay. late on spots. Hold on more in a moment. The end of this hour, but fear not. We'll talk further about the JFK assassination with our expert guests, Dr. David Kaiser and Dr. Warner Spitz, after news. Stay right there. More coming up after news. <laughs> David Newman here, and we continue with two expert perspectives on the John F. K. Uh, John F. Kennedy assassination, uh, whose 25th anniversary occurs next week. Again, our guests are Dr. Warner Spitz, who's appeared as a professional expert in two separate investigations of the Kennedy assassination, and by telephone, the historian David Kaiser of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, who has made a long time study of the various assassination theories and is in some measure skeptical about some of them the exact dimensions of which, not entirely clear, but he does not hold with the official view. I hope that in part summarizes uh, where you stand, Dr. Kaiser. Well, the official view hasn't been proven. Uh, unfortunately, neither has anything else. I would say that the Warren Commission was unable for various reasons to do a thorough job and, and did not. Not all of them their fault. I would also say that a large body of evidence, um, circumstantial hearsay and the other kinds of evidence has been developed, suggesting that organized crime may in fact have been behind the assassination. And why? Why were they behind it? Yes, yes. Oh, Give us the theory. Uh, the theory, um, as propounded most thorough, well, most effectively, I think, by G. Robert Blakey and David Billings, who were the counsel and uh, another employee of the Assassination Committee, was simply that um, organized crime was under tremendous pressure from Robert Kennedy. We know that. Yes, that in particular, uh, the boss of the New Orleans branch, Carlos Marcello, Marcello, who I believe is still alive. And in prison and very much alive, yes. Has, has, and who had been deported. Um, by Robert Kennedy, although he beat that, uh, was very upset about this, 
And um, and this is one of the most interesting uh, um, aspects of Blakey theory, that the mob felt that John Kennedy was fair game because he had betrayed them and because, as they interpreted it, he may have accepted favors from them in the form of uh, women introduced to him by by mob figures. They thought they had a deal. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, How about Johnny Roselli and company as intermediaries for a plot to kill Castro with a phony beard and all that yeah, whole thing? Well, that, that is a fact that, in fact, uh, the CIA had approached John Roselli and, I believe, Sam Gincana, right. uh, although I don't keep all this straight in my head, 20, 365 days a year, uh, to carry out the assassination of Fidel Castro. Yes, and this is what I'm talking about when I say, for instance, the Warren Commission couldn't do a thorough job. They just didn't know about that. All right. Or, in fact, one of them probably did know about it. I beg your pardon, <laughs> Alan Dulles, but uh, he didn't talk about it. Um, yes, they had done that, and... Uh, is that to you a more plausible scenario than the one that we are, for lack of a better one, supposedly left with? Lee Harvey Oswald, yes. the flight... The expatriate returned, the man of mysterious background and unstable nature doing all this stuff himself. Well, let me, I think it is slightly more plausible, but not enough so that I feel I know. And let me explain that. Sure. The tricky thing about Oswald is this. There, there are two very tricky points. On the one hand, he had a number of associations which are suspicious with respect to people he's been identified with. And here's another area where the world is, I, I don't think, and, and this was probably largely the fault of the FBI that they were relying on. They did not do that good a job. On the other hand, with one exception, I believe, uh, we have documented how Oswald could have carried out the whole actual crime on his own without any assistance. Right. The only exception, which doesn't necessarily prove anything, is that I believe it is true that, that uh, no one ever um, could discover how Oswald had gotten the ammunition for his rifle. Uh, that doesn't mean he didn't do it himself, but, but the, they never found out. Well, there are, other, there are other questions perhaps not as strong, and we'll, well, tackle well them. But the key thing, but you see, then the thing you have to explain is Jack Ruby. Now, in a way, you see, you ask the question about the wrong man. If you believe the lone assassin theory, you also have to believe that Jack Ruby uh, went to Parkland Hospital, hung around the Dallas police station the whole weekend, or much of the weekend, I mean, I don't mean the whole weekend, much of the weekend, including the night Oswald was arrested, and then shot Oswald in full view of a telephone audience out of his own emotional... Sense. Yeah, and sense of chivalry, that's the way he describes that's it. Right. I've I got to tell you, Dr. Kaiser, I don't find that implausible. Now, it may be my own predilections and biases in terms of analyzing evidence as, a, as just a, a lay member of the public come into it, but I've never had any trouble at all with Jack Ruby's motivation. Not not one wit, not one jot. It well, seems entirely persuasive to me, and, and just hear me out for a second. Sure, sure, sure. That here is a guy with a kind of a seamy background who regards himself as a kind of knight errant and really did admire JFK, and may have even heard that uh, he was friendly with, with mafia types, and that wasn't so bad either, because he was too. At any rate, he will do the great, noble, and shining thing according to his own perverted understanding of chivalry and nobility, and that is to off the man who killed the president and thereby save Jackie all the trauma of the trial and so on. Well, that last... Um point about Jackie, I think, is one of the weaker That's what he said, parts apparently. of your argument. Yes, well, his, his life had not on the whole demonstrated a great respect for women. Well, no, 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 no. See, as there we really do part company. Because there is, there, there's the classic kind of hypocrisy of a not very reputable man. When you, when you think well, about the psychology of such people, they often do have this sort of well, duality of nature. To, I'm, I'm responsible for this as much as you are. We, we, we probably ought to, to stop this because we don't know him and we're both speculating. Well, yeah, but... Yeah, I can't prove that you're wrong uh, by any means, but I I just don't agree. I, I think that it, it is more plausible that Jack Ruby was doing this because somebody had told what you're, What you're saying, and then we will bury this, is, is, is nightclub owners with mafia connections don't act in a chivalrous way. And I say that's nonsense because there's, there, there's a typical kind of contradictory nature the show of chivalry, the show of nobility, and in fact the thuggish nature underneath, 
which is no contradiction at all. It's part of the same personality, well-recognized, well-documented. That's, that's my position for what it's worth. Yes, sir. Why, Chief Fred? Yes, sir.